Amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you can, or your Bible app to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, is where we want to uh, begin. We're going to spend a little time in there, just a little bit of time. And I want to talk to you about connected. There's so much in the scripture uh, about this idea that you and I, uh, as believers, are first and foremost connected to Christ uh, when we received him as our Lord and Savior. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what that's about. Uh, but then we're also, as we're connected to Christ, we're also connected to one another. How many of you know we're connected? Amen? Amen. And so I want to just uh, start off here in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to emphasize a few verses afterwards uh, from this passage uh, that I, I think is going to show us some things and, and hopefully inspire you. I want to inspire you. I want to equip you. I want to help you. And, and even if need be, I want the Holy Spirit to convict you. All right? Is that all right? All right. So let's start with verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 4. If you're there, say yes. All right, the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit says this, or writes to the Ephesians and therefore to us as the church today. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. I'll pause there for a moment. Remember now, he's writing to the entire church at Ephesus, right? And in that, to that church in Ephesus, he's saying, basically, you all have a calling. You all have a calling. And there are certain things that are common for every believer that we have a calling to be. We have a calling to be a light in our part of the world. We have a calling uh, to, to fulfill uh, certain things. And, and, and all of us, we could say, have specific things that God wants us to fulfill that may be unlike others. Uh, but because, and that's because we're all unique, aren't we? And so sometimes, you know, if you remember last, I think it was last fall, we had uh, Reverend uh, Tony Cook here with us, and he spoke about the end of spectator church. And, and, you know, the whole thing is, you know, we're not called as believers to just be spectators. We're called to do something. We're called uh, to, to accomplish things that further the kingdom of God. Isn't that right? Amen. And so as he goes on with this, notice verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering. So lowliness is like humility and gentleness with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. How many of you know, you know, as believers, we gather together and some people leave churches because they can't get along with people. But the Bible says we need to learn to bear with one another. That means put up with one another. That means put up with people that you might not even like. But God has placed you with them to rub you the wrong way to help you grow. That was more enthusiastic on that subject than I thought it would be. Hallelujah. All right. And so going on with verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now he goes on. There's one body, the body of Christ overall. There is one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, that's Jesus. One faith that saves, that's, of course, faith in Christ. One baptism, and most uh, expositors that I read after would say, there's one baptism that saves, and it's not water baptism. The one baptism that saves is baptized into Christ, spiritual baptism. Amen? And then he goes on and he says this. He says, uh, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And so by the Holy Spirit, he dwells within us. Isn't that right? He lives within us. Uh, he is active in our lives. Now going on. Verse 7, but to each one of us, how many of you know that means you and me, all of us, doesn't leave out any of us, does it? But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so notice this word measure. According to the measure of Christ's gift, he has given to each one of us a measure of the gift of Christ. Now, if we were to go to John's gospel, we're not going to, but in John's gospel, chapter 3 and verse 34, it refers to Jesus having the spirit without measure. How many of you know he had the fullness of the spirit? Amen. He had the spirit without measure. Uh, but here it says that you and I as believers have a measure of the gift of Christ. And so as we read on in this, I'll expound on that just a little bit more. You'll notice that it goes on and it says this. And this is a quote from Psalm 68, verse 18. It says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men or to people in general. And so what's he saying? He's saying uh, there, as it was a prophetic word, word and then coming over and applying it to Christ, when he ascended, how many of you know he ascended to the right hand of the Father, sat down at the Father's right hand, isn't that right? When he ascended, he, 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 he gave gifts to people. He gave gifts became available to all believers throughout the ages because God, of course, is timeless, amen? 
And so throughout the, throughout the, the timeline of all the church age, there has been available giftings to all believers. And so don't ever say, I don't have any giftings from God. I've, I've been guilty of saying that. I've been guilty of saying that in the past, uh, but really that is not biblically sound. The Bible says he gave gifts to men to each one. He gave a measure. He is the one without measure, and he dispersed measures of giftings to each and every one. Are you following what I'm saying to you? And so you have a measure of the gift of Christ. And then he goes on and he says this in verse 9. Now this he ascended. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He descended first. We're not going to elaborate on that, but we know that he went uh, into the lower parts of the earth, and uh, there's a lot involved with that. I, I don't even know. I'm going to open up a can of worms, but, uh, you know, he, he emptied paradise, which was in the lower parts of the earth, the Old Testament believers. He emptied that, brought them up out of paradise or Abraham's bosom because now he paid the price that they could come directly into the presence of God in heaven. Whereas prior to Christ dying, uh, they were put uh, into a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise as a waiting place, a great place, a wonderful place. But now that Christ died for them as well as you and me, they could be transported into heaven itself. And so he what? He led uh, captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. And then going on with this, now notice it says, verse 9, Now this he ascended, what does it mean that he also first descended in the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill or fulfill all things. And he gave, now here's some, some of the giftings that he gave. And he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, so that the, sa the saints are the believers, all believers, right? You can respond when I ask a question. You, you can respond if you could. That, 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 help me, all right? And so saints, biblically, are all true believers in Jesus Christ. Those that have been born again, right? And so you, if you're born again, you are a saint according to the scriptures. Now, you may not always act like a saint, but you are a saint according to the scriptures. So uh, going on with that now, it says that those giftings, those five mentioned in verse 11, were given for the equipping or the preparing of the saints, the believers, for the work of ministry. In other words, so that the saints would be equipped for works of ministry, ministry meaning service, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. And so all of us as believers are to be equipped by ministries that are mentioned, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, so that we can help uh, edify, build up the rest of the body. Do you know that part of your calling is to build up other believers, to strengthen their walk? We strengthen each other, don't we? As, as we're around one another, as we speak words of encouragement and exhortation, we bring strength to one another, even as we work and and, and labor for the Lord uh, before one another. We are bringing strength uh, to each other. Amen. And the thing with it is, is various giftings, they are not there to compete with other giftings. They're there to complement other giftings, aren't they? And so your gifting complements your brother, your sister's ministry, your service to the Lord. See, ministry just means service. Sometimes we uh, put it, you know, we think that ministry means preaching and teaching and all of that. Ministry means service. And so some people serve cleaning the place. Some people serve ministering to the children. Some people serve or minister uh, to uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the ushers ministry, the, the sound, etc. All the various things, the youth, etc. You know, these are all ministries in serving. But sometimes we think of serving or ministry, I should say, as only preaching or teaching. That's not the case. That's not the case. It's ministry to pour the juice in children's ministry. It's ministry to make the coffee. One of my favorite ministries, by the way. <laughs> and we appreciate everybody, everybody who's doing anything in the church. You are in the ministry. You are in the ministry. Now, as we read on further in this, uh, in the time that we have, now notice now he goes on and he says this. Verse 13 tells us how long these ministries are going to be, whether it be the five mentioned in verse 11 or then the equipping of the saints so that they can uh, be equipped for ministry and for edifying the rest of the body. It says, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's basically saying until Christ comes again. We have a portion of the 
immeasurable amount of spirit that's upon Christ. We have been distributed with a portion of his anointing, whatever it might be, and now that will take place until he comes again. Does that make sense? All right, you know, you think about Je Jesus. He didn't feel he was too good to do anything. How many of you know he washed the disciples' feet? And that was in that day, that culture, that custom was, that was the lowest of the lowest of servants' jobs. Jesus said himself, I didn't come. I, I came to serve. I came to pay a ransom, didn't he, right? I, I mean, he came with a servant's heart. Uh, and, and he said that we are to be like him. Isn't that right? Is everybody with me? If we're going to be Christ-like, then serving is a part of being Christ-like because he came to serve. He said so himself. Now, reading on with this now. It says in verse 14, as it goes on, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That certainly applies to the day in which we live. We need to be together. This is all talking about really being gathered together uh, with apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, uh, ministry people, uh, everybody in the body of Christ, the saints coming, uh, being equipped for the work of the ministry to build up one another. Why? Uh, because there is deception out there. There's trickery of men and deceitful plottings and we help each other stay safe from it in Jesus name. Isn't that right? Amen. And we know that that is something that is rampant today. There's so much, so much uh, uh, deception. And you and I, I determined by faith that we at Abounding Grace, we will not be like children tossed to and fro. We're not going to swallow every wind of doctrine that comes along. We're going to stay established, rooted, grounded in the Word of God, which is our way of, of measuring everything else that's taught out there. Isn't that right? Amen. And see, we become a check and a balance for each other, don't we? You become a check and a balance for me because all of you have access to a Bible. And you can say, Pastor, look at that scripture. I think you're wrong. And that's okay with me because you know what? I've admitted I was wrong about things before. I want to be right. And so I will receive correction. How about you? Amen? Because we're all in a process of growth, aren't we? We're all in a process of growth. We're all on a journey of growth. And we're all, we've all got room to grow till Jesus comes again. I know some people have this attitude. Well, I've been a Christian a long time. I don't really need Bible study anymore. Well, you know what? Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And as it goes on with this, notice verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice how the Kenneth Weiss translation, Kenneth Weiss was a Greek scholar, of verses 15 and 16 of Ephesians 4. Notice how he says it up on the screen. He said, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. How many of you know we all need some growing up to do? Isn't that right? may grow up into him in all things, who is the head, Christ. And so now we have this metaphor of Christ as the head and the people of God as the body of Christ, right? And members in particular, each of us a member in a body, the body of Christ, he being the head. It says, from whom the whole body constantly being joined closely together. Now remember, I entitled this Connected joined closely together, connected, and constantly being knit together through every joint of supply, according to the operative energy put forth to the capacity of each part, makes for increased growth of the body, resulting in the building up of itself in the sphere of love. Now let's go on just with this. I could, I could elaborate on this a little bit, but I want to emphasize these phrases, joined closely together and knit together. My prayer uh, is that we, as this local body of believers, as, we, as we're together, as we grow together, as we work together, as we serve together, that we would become more and more joined closer together as a family of God, because we can do so much more together than what any of us can do individually. And so defining this phrase, join closely together, it means to fit together in a coherent and compatible manner, to fit together. Many translations actually translate it, fitting together or fit together. God has a fit for each and every one of us, somewhere where we fit. And then the words knit together mean to bring together into a unit, to bring together to cause to be a unit or to unite or to combine. I like that word unite, the idea of uniting us. And that should be, as I mentioned, a prayer for us. Father, I pray 
that this church called Abounding Grace, the people of God that call this their local church, their local family of God. Father, I pray uh, that we become more and more joined closer together and we are knitted together in our hearts toward one another as we serve you together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now notice how the New Living Translation reads this. It says instead, this again, verses 15 and 16 of Ephesians 4. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing up in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. That makes it very clear. Who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And so notice now, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work, which tells us that every part of the body of Christ has a special work that God has for us to do. Isn't that right? Amen. Now, the New English translation, a very well-respected translation of those same verses, but practicing the truth and love, we will in all things grow up in Christ, who is the head. From him the whole body grows, fitted and held together through every supporting ligament. As each one does its part, the body builds itself up in love. And so what's it saying? It's saying that every part of the body, as they do their part, the rest of the body of Christ is built up the way God wants it built up. You know, God wants to do a greater work here than ever before. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, sometimes I get very weary asking for help. I get very weary with it. In fact, I've told my wife, I said, what's the point? What's the point talking about it anymore? Because people don't do it. People are not willing. They want to be spectators. And those of you that are helping, this doesn't apply to you. We appreciate everybody that helps. And I know some of you are new and you've not decided whether this is your church yet. We understand that. That's, it's not to put pressure or condemnation on anybody. But the point is there's many that God wants to use in a greater way, whether it's doing uh, sound or media or ushering. We need help with ushering. Uh, children's ministry, et cetera. There's always something uh, that we could use help with. And, uh, you know, we've been going now, this church, for 32 years. I was, I was 32 years old. Now I gave away my age, didn't I? I was 32 years old when we started the church, and I turned 64 in October, so 32 years, 32 years we've been going, and I'll tell you, we're not stopping. We believe God started. How many of you know what God starts? He's going to finish it. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, sometimes people say, people ask, somebody asked me not long ago because he didn't know what I did. He, he, I was at Stewart's, one of the Stewart's near our house, and the guy, I knew him from before when I did pest control and whatever. He says, so are you retired? <laughs> <laughs> no, how can you retire? How can you retire from being a minister? You know, retirement's okay for people that are working secular jobs. And, you know, really, any secular job can be a ministry as well if you'll treat it like a ministry. I'm not talking about preaching to people all the time when you're supposed to be working. I'm talking about being a light, just shining by your work ethic, by other things that you do in your life. Isn't that right? Are you following what I'm saying? All right. But, you know, sometimes people retire from their regular job, and, instead, and they don't just say, I'm going to sit around and enjoy life. No, they refire. They get on fire. They start doing something else for God, and it's a great blessing, and the latter part of their life is greater than the former part of their life. Isn't that right? Amen. And so, you know, for me, a retirement's not an option. I mean, I don't know if we'll always pastor. I mean, I live to be 95. You'll probably want somebody younger by then. Uh, but I don't know if I'll always pastor. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing. I'll always be serving God. Always be serving God. And I pray uh, that all of us, all of us would have this mentality that no matter what God asks me to do, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to serve. I'm going to be one who washes people's feet, so to speak. I'm going to follow Jesus and be Christ-like and serve those uh, that come across my path and, and serve Jesus in doing so. In Jesus' name, amen. But it says that we're not to use our, our, our liberty. How I many of you know you're free? Say, I'm free for an occasion to the flesh. So we're saved to serve. We're not saved to be selfish. We're not saved to be self-serving. We're saved to serve, to serve God. It's not about, you know, getting saved and just enjoying getting fed all the time. How many of you know if all you do is get fed all the time spiritually and don't do anything with it, I want you to know you're going to get fat and sassy and you're not going to fulfill the plan that God has for your life. And I want you to know as I close this today that all of us, 
are going to stand before God one day. And we're going to give account as to whether or not we fulfilled the plan, the destiny that he has for, his, for our lives. I don't know. You know, when I got saved, and especially when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, my heart was always, God, what, would I, what do you want me to do? And I, whatever I found my hand to do, I would do it. I was a sound man. I showed I was just a teenager, 17, 18 years old. I was a sound man for a while. Didn't even know what I was doing. I was a sound man. I, I would go to every work day. My dad would come to. We'd build walls. We'd tear down walls. We, we'd do whatever, whatever we had to do. Uh, we, we had a heart for God. We had a heart to serve God. We wanted to please God. Uh, we weren't doing it for people. We weren't doing it for the pastor. We were doing it for Jesus, everything we did. Amen? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so these are things to consider things to pray about, things to truly think about. And, and you know, you don't have to hear a voice from heaven saying, thus saith the Lord. Some of you would have to hear that in order to work in the nursery, probably. Some of you may have even prayed that, God, I'll work in the nursery, but I got to hear you thunder it from heaven to me. I want you to know God's not going to do that. But you know, if you'll be faithful in some things, God will give you other things. And you know, you're more blessed to give than you are to just receive. Jesus said that himself. Amen. 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 We love you. And, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm sharing partly here. I'm sharing from the word, but I'm also sharing from my heart that we need help, especially with the kids. Not all of you should be with the kids. All right. But we do need help. And if you're a parent, you should or a grandparent, you should consider helping. If people help, you know, we could have enough people once a month you'd be in there. Or once every two months, maybe you'd be in there because many hands make light work. Isn't that right? Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you, Father God, for your word. I thank you that we are connected. I thank you for joining us closer to you and to each other, for fitting us in, Father God, to the places that you want us to be. And Father God, we just thank you for helping each and every one, Father God, to know that this wasn't meant for condemnation. This is just meant for, yes, maybe correction, encouragement, whatever the case may be, Father God, because we know you have a plan. You have a purpose for this body of believers, Father God. We're here for such a time as this. We don't know what the future holds, but we know that you have prepared us, and we have a strong foundation in the Word of God. In these 32 years, Father God, you've helped us to 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 build a strong foundation in the Word, Father God. And by your grace, we'll continue, we'll thrive, we'll grow, we'll win more people to Christ. We'll see more people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, healed and set free, lives changed and turned around. Father, that's our heart's desire. And it takes us all doing each our part as we accomplish your plan. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's just remain in a reverential attitude right now. Before we partake of communion, let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, the Bible says that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all failed, we've all broken God's law. And because we've broken God's law, we are guilty and deserve punishment. We deserve God's judgment. I deserve God's judgment. I deserve hell. I deserve the lake of fire, and so do all of you. But the good news is that Jesus came as our substitute to take the penalty, the judgment that you and I deserve, so that if we put faith in what he's done, we'll be forgiven, and our sins will be washed by his blood, and we can have a right relationship with God and receive that new life that we have talked about uh, during this time together this morning. And so if you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You could die today and there's no second chance. There's no such thing as purgatory or limbo. That's a man-made idea. There's now in this life, you must make up your mind as to whether or not you're going to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So lest there be one here today and you've never received him as your Lord and Savior, would you just lift your hand up high? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come up here. I'm not going to point you out. But we're all going to pray together, lest there be even one here today. Anybody at all, you've never accepted Christ. All right, I believe the Lord is working in you if you haven't, and maybe everybody here is. But I believe the Spirit of God is working in your heart and pointing out the fact that you need Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Let's all pray this prayer together for the sake of those that may watch later. If you believe this, this is based on Romans 10, 9, and 10. Let's pray this. God in heaven, I thank you that Jesus died for me. The perfect one. The perfect God-man. 
took upon flesh so that as a man, sinless as he was, would bear my sin and my judgment so I could be forgiven. And so today, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I believe with all my heart that he not only died, but he's risen. So come live in me today, Lord. Take my life and make it what you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. If you did pray that kind of prayer for the first time in accepting Christ, and if you meant it, the Bible says you're now a new creation on the inside. Old things have passed away and everything has become new. And so grab hold of that. It's only the beginning, though. Now you need to grow. You need to learn and grow and get to know him more intimately. And you do that by being with other believers, whether it's here or another church that teaches the Bible. Lots of churches out there, they don't all teach the Bible. And so, uh, you know, then you need to be in one and grow and learn and be with other people and serve. One of the greatest ways to, one of the greatest ways, you're not going to grow like you should grow unless you're serving the Lord as well.